The American attack, Fuchida felt, caused Yamamoto to recoil from it. Had the raid not taken place, the Japanese Navy would have moved south to Fiji, Fuchida lamented in later years. Gender DJD not go that far. He had heard about the Midway plan on 19 April, the day after the raid, in the combined fleet staff room aboard the Yamato. Obviously, the strategy had been under study for some time, but he agreed with Fuchida that the raid worried Yamamoto no end. In his opinion, the Admiral made his big mistake updating the Midway schedule, rushing it through before the first air fleet had had sufficient time to prepare for such a massive operation. Yamamoto decided upon the plan to occupy Midway and the Aleutians because he was obsessed with protecting the homeland, above all the Emperor. He was determined to form a protective shield around Japan so far north and so far east that never again could the United States attack the main Japanese islands. Fuchida was devoted to Yamamoto. Still, facts were facts, and when he heard of the Admiral's latest scheme, he labelled it grammar school strategy. This was defensive psychology, to keep the United States from striking Japan instead of carrying the war into the American camp. To occupy Midway would decide nothing as long as the United States held Hawaii. Fuchida understood that Yamamoto and his backers hoped the attack on Midway would force the US fleet to come out and fight, hence give the Japanese the chance to destroy it. But this was secondary to the occupation of Midway. The strategy had an important flaw. It revolved around a limited objective, the protection of the emperor and the imperial family. This is nonsense, said Fuchida irritably to Gender. Of course Tokyo will be bombed again. If necessary, the emperor should be moved to Kyoto or Nara. Either of those historic cities would be less accessible to enemy bombers than huge, sprawling Tokyo, with its readily visible imperial compound. At the time of the Doolittle Raid, many Americans criticised it severely as at best premature, at worst a criminal waste of brave men and much-needed planes in an empty gesture of bravado. It is doubtful if Doolittle himself ever expected any such far-reaching consequences as his brief bombing expedition triggered. His raiders had accomplished what the whole Japanese naval hierarchy could not. They had made underscore Isoroku Yamamoto lose his cool and plunge precipitously into an ill-considered course of action. As soon. As the first air fleet returned to Japan on 22nd April, Yamamoto ordered Nagumo and key members of his staff to report to the Yamato, there for the first time they heard about the Midway scheme. The plan aimed first to occupy Midway, and second, in doing so, to lure the remaining ships of the US Pacific Fleet beyond the atoll, where Japanese forces could destroy them. The first air fleet would covert the landing and act as the advance escort for Yamamoto's main body. The latter, an assemblage of battleships, cruisers, light carriers and destroyers, would stay 300 miles in the rear. Then, at the strategic moment, thunder forth to annihilate whatever American ships escaped the Nagumo force. Meanwhile, another major aggregation of ships would attack American forces in the Aleutians. The high brass assigned Nagumo an important mission, but allowed him no hand in the planning. Most of his staff disapproved. As spokesman, Kusaka tried to explain that the task force could not yet undertake another major campaign. The ships required overhaul, and the crews needed rest after being on the go for so long. He wanted time to train new air crews before starting out again. Gender did not oppose the plan as such. He could see its possibilities if carried out properly. Here was the long-awaited chance to force a decisive battle with the American main force, but he too strongly urged postponement. Upon return from the Indian Ocean, many veteran pilots had been whisked away to land bases. Lacking them, Gender at the very least would need time to train their replacements. He also recommended that the Aleutian portion of the plan be scrapped, since it split the combined fleet's strength. On behalf of his second carrier division, Yamaguchi strongly supported Gender's position. When overruled, he became one of the Midway Plan's most ardent advocates. Fuchida vigorously opposed the idea. His exhausted men needed rest, and the ships and planes needed overhaul. Midway would be useless for the Japanese not worth fighting for. Even if they could occupy the base, they wouldn't be able to maintain it. As for luring out the US Pacific Fleet, that had been Fushida's primary idea ever since Pearl Harbor. But the United States, 
Australia cut-off operation would accomplish that purpose and still give the First Air Fleet time to prepare men and materiel for a major battle. In short order, combined fleet headquarters made it clear that they had already settled on the plan and expected the carrier men to agree, not argue. The memory left Fuchida torn between anger and bitter laughter. It was like this. This is your duty. Go to Midway and fight. There was no real planning, preparation or thinking. All nonsense. Fuchida made one forlorn attempt to reach Yamamoto through an air staff officer, Commander Akira Sasaki. When he boarded the Yamato, he discovered that Sasaki backed Yamamoto's midway scheme to the letter, which was not surprising. Once Yamamoto made up his mind, his fiercely loyal staff stuck to him like barnacles. We'll occupy Midway and thus force the US Pacific Fleet out in the open, Sasaki told him. After Midway, we'll occupy Hawaii. Forget about Midway, Fuchida urged. The base is no good and this is all a waste of time. We should move at once against the Fijis and Samoa, then Pearl Harbor. The US fleet will come out anyway to keep Australia from being isolated. When it does, we can destroy it. Fuchida had the feeling that Sasaki, a career naval aviator, was more or less of the same mind but could not openly disagree with Yamamoto. So instead he went and talked to Kuroshima. Fuchida was no admirer of Captain Kameto Kuroshima, Yamamoto's senior staff officer. He considered Kuroshima to blame for the insistence upon maintaining supremacy of the southern operation in the face of the unexpected success at Pearl Harbor. Now he hunted up Kuroshima in the latter's messy cabin. The Japanese Navy was never quite as devoted to spit and polish as its American counterpart, but Kuroshima carried indifference to majestic heights. Papers all over the place, Fuchida had to pick his way through an obstacle course of dirty dishes and sticky glasses full of cigarette butts. Alian, bald, taut-faced man usually enveloped in cigarette smoke, Kuroshima had a sharp and introspective mind, but he didn't understand air power. He was a gunnery officer, said Fuchida, and he wanted to fight the Battle of the Japan Sea at Midway. So Fuchida didn't waste his breath talking to him about the first air fleet's assigned duties. He confined his arguments to the proposed use of Yamamoto's main body. If the battleships are to stay 300 miles behind the carriers, what good are they? Fuchida asked. Why bother to sortie at all if you're coming out only to watch? Who do you intend to fight? Who is your enemy? He prodded. Kuroshima only shrugged his thin shoulders and replied, No enemy. Quite confident that the Pacific Fleet didn't amount to much. All the logistical arguments the first air fleet staff could muster bounced off the combined feet staff like buckshot off the Yamato, but not one of Nagumo's officers opposed Midway, because they thought it might be too risky, or that they might lose the battle. It never occurred to any of them that the first air fleet couldn't handle the entire mission by itself. This smug confidence, recalled Fuchida, was the beginning of the Japanese defeat at Midway. On 28 and 29 April, at a big conference aboard the Yamato, representatives of the Naval General Staff, the Combined Fleet and the First Air Fleet, reviewed the exploits of the Nagumo force and discussed the lessons learned. As principal speaker, Gender explained operations up to that time. The brass-heavy audience bubbled with praise. This was more pleasant than helpful. What ideas for improvement came up originated with the carrier men. Yamaguchi suggested that the combined fleet be reorganized into three task forces, two for immediate use, a third to be ready at the end of the year. Fuchida urged that the first fleet, as the main body was often called, and the first air fleet be combined into one superforce under Yamamoto's personal command, with six carriers at the centre and all the vessels of the first fleet as support. If the two fleets fight as one unit, they will be practically invincible. But this can't be if the Yamato and the rest of the main body trail 300 miles behind the first air fleet. Fuchida was quite naive to think that Yamamoto, with such staff officers as Ugaki and Kuroshima, not to mention a solid backlog of battleship admirals, would adopt his idea. In effect, this combination would be a super task force and would reduce all the main body's battleships, including the mighty Yamato, to the level of escort vessels. The thought patterns of generations are not so easily set aside. Next, Fuchida brought up the matter closest to his heart, a plan which he called the flight concept. 
It was high time that the Japanese Navy ceased thinking of pilots as belonging to individual carriers. Crews should be assigned to a flight and used on any flat top, depending on need. The best trained pilots from all the carriers should belong to one flight, which would battle the enemy at sea. Back in the homeland, new pilots would be trained not only in operational techniques, but also to think in terms of the flight. These men would constitute the second team, ready to go to sea and fight when necessary. This was a revolutionary idea. Throughout naval history, the ship had been the basic unit to which men were assigned. Their captain led them into battle. Fuchida didn't see how this made sense applied to a carrier. Skippers of flat tops were not combat leaders. They were only hotel managers, said Fuchida. Each aircraft should be free to operate as part of a mobile flight. Flyers shouldn't consider themselves Akagi men or Hiryu men. They should be able to function anywhere without getting tangled in red tape or hampered by false sentimentality. Yamaguchi and Genda supported Fuchida's proposal. Kusaka agreed that it had possibilities. However, he wanted to give higher authority plenty of time to think it over. This is too big a problem for a quick decision, he said. We'll have to wait. The postponement disappointed Fuchida, for he had hoped his plan would be adopted in time for Midway. A few days after this conference, Fuchida's stomach began to bother him, and he went on sick call. As Kagoshima had no Navy hospital, the base doctor sent him to the nearest Army hospital for X-rays. There he remained for about two weeks under observation. Finally, the doctors told him that he had a stomach ulcer and ordered him to give up drinking. He did so with great reluctance. During his stay in the hospital, the Battle of the Coral Sea was fought on 7, the 8th of May. General headquarters announced it as a major Japanese victory, and the press outdid itself with flowery articles of praise and exultation. But Fuchida and other knowledgeable airmen couldn't rejoice. True, the Japanese had sunk the U.S. carrier Lexington and mauled the Yorktown, but the Americans had sunk the light carrier Shoho and damaged the Shokaku. In addition, the 5th Carrier Division's plane losses were heavy. Tactically, Japan scored higher in carrier action. Nevertheless, it is a peculiar sort of victory to lose twice as many men as the enemy and not to achieve one's strategic objective. When Fuchida returned to duty and talked over the battle with Genda, they had to admit that the Japanese suffered a strategic defeat at Coral Sea. Moreover, it meant that before the Midway operation even started, two of Japan's best carriers, the Shokaku and Zuikaku, would have to be scratched. They couldn't be repaired and refitted in time to participate. The obvious course would have been to postpone the operation, at least until the Zuikaku was ready to participate. Yet the loss did not cause the combined feat to take a second look at the midway scheme. In almost every way, planning and preparation for this battle fell below the standards set for Operation Hawaii. Security especially suffered in contrast, Gender discovered that even forces not scheduled to take part knew about the plan. One day, in a conversation with several other officers aboard the Akagi, Takehiko Chihaya remarked that in Kure such men as barbers and masters of small drinking places have known that we are going to head for Midway this time. A particular source of annoyance to Fuchida was Kusaka's absence. Instead of being available to work on the coming campaign, he was trying to obtain double promotions for the 55 officers and men of the Naval Air Force who had been killed at Pearl Harbor. Such double promotions had been immediately awarded to the nine midget submariners who had died in that attack. On March 1942, Tokyo had announced the heroic achievements of the Special Attack Flotilla. The Navy's publicity spokesman, Captain Hideo Hirad, never at a loss for words, eulogized the nine heroes as the guardian gods of Japan in a radio address more remarkable for eloquence and imagination than for accuracy. He went so far as to credit a mid-get submarine with sinking the Arizona. Having seen that battleship blow up practically under his nose, Fuchida knew better. Like many men of the first air fleet, he resented the fact that the Navy seemed to have forgotten the 55 airmen, equally brave and equally dead, who with their comrades accounted for all the damage at Pearl Harbor. Still, he was not one to linger in the past. Let the midget submen have credit for the Arizona if it will keep the peace, he said. The first air fleet had a new campaign on its hands and needed its chief of staff. 
The air fleet sorted from the inland sea on the morning of 27 May, Japan's Navy Day. As the fleet was passing through Bungo Channel, Fuchida doubled up in excruciating pain. He called out to his orderly to get the flight surgeon at once. At first, the Akagi's surgeon, Dr. Tamai, thought like the army doctors that Fuchida's stomach was protesting against too much alcohol. But when Fuchida's pain intensified, there could be no question of the diagnosis, appendicitis. You must have immediate surgery, he said. He broke the news to Fuchida's superiors. Nagumo, Kusaka and Genda hurried to his cabin and held an impromptu consultation around his bunk. They wanted to send him by destroyer to the naval hospital at Beppu, a few hours' voyage from the carrier. But Fuchida put his foot down. The Akagi served as the task force's floating surgery, and her medical complement was perfectly capable of handling an appendectomy. Besides, even if he couldn't actively participate in the forthcoming battle, at least he would be available for consultation if needed and in place for the post-battle plan. Nagumo agreed to let him stay. He wasn't sorry to keep his veteran flight leader on tap, and his good sailor's heart told him how much being present meant to Fuchida. They discussed what type of anesthesia would be best. Dr. Tamai preferred a general anesthetic, but Fuchida held out for a local in order not to lose hours of consciousness and to encourage a quick recovery. He couldn't avoid missing the midway action, but he had no intention of missing the next campaign. With a local, he would be back in harness in two weeks. Dr. Tamai operated at about 22 on 27 May. For the next two days, he permitted Fuchida neither food nor drink. For a hearty trencherman, this enforced diet was an ordeal, but hunger and post-operative aches were not nearly so painful as being cheated out of the forthcoming battle. He cursed his luck. Understanding friends visited him daily, briefing him on the course of events. From their conversation, he had a good idea of what was happening during the voyage eastward. After a few days, Gender joined the group of patients in sick bay. Weakened by work over a long period, he came down with a feverish cold that threatened to develop into pneumonia. On the morning of the 4th of June Japanese time, the surgeon removed Fuchida's stitches. That evening, he walked to the head and back, feeling wobbly. Thankfully, he sank back into bed. He knew it was no use trying to rush nature's work. At any rate, he had won his battle to stay aboard the Akagi. How could he know that this would be his last night aboard that grand carrier he loved so much? Early the next morning, Fuchida awoke to the sound of aircraft engines. Sick Bay lay well below the waterline, so he could see nothing, but he knew that topside his men were preparing for takeoff. He looked around the curtained-off corner of Sick Bay, which he shared with two junior officers. The first, a Nisei, who had cast his lot with Japan and served as an interpreter. The second, an assistant paymaster. Both young men appeared to be sleeping. Well, that was all right. Neither of them would be participating in the day's action. But what about Mitsuo Fuchida? The chief flight commanding officer got sick and couldn't participate in the big battle, so I was ashamed. He knew then that he couldn't remain in bed lapped in comfort and self-pity. His place was with his men. Even if I couldn't fly with them, I could encourage them by waving my hand as they took off. That was the least I could do. Dr. Tamai had not given Fuchida permission to leave sick bay, but what the surgeon didn't know wouldn't hurt him. Tentatively, Fuchida slid out of bed. He would have to reach his cabin and change into uniform before presenting himself on deck. He wobbled across the room and tried the door. As he suspected, crewmen had fastened the doors and portholes for watertight integrity. Each door, however, contained a manhole for use in emergency. A large crank opened it. Fuchida gripped the crank and applied all his strength. Slowly it began to turn. Cold sweat poured down his face. Finally the cover opened just enough to let him through. Then he had to do the whole business over again in reverse to maintain watertight security. The gangway Fuchida thus entered was also sealed off. By climbing a small ladder, he reached another manhole leading up to the cabin area. This one proved much more difficult to open. The ladder provided but a slim foothold, and Fuchida had used up much strength already. Then too, being in such a hurry for fear his men would take off before he reached the flight deck made him clumsy. When he finally crawled through, his muscles were quivering, but the struggle had only begun, for he had to open and close a total of ten manholes to reach his cabin. 
Several times he almost fainted. Exhausted and drenched with sweat, he had to rest in his cabin until his legs would support him again. Then he washed, shaved, and put on his uniform, feeling much better. Then he proceeded to the flight deck. Most of his comrades were too busy to pay more than passing attention to him. Commander Shogo Masuda, the Akagi's air officer, threw him an anxious, Are you all right? And Fuchida smiled in answer. In the command post, he joined the flight officers gathered to await takeoff and buttonholed Furukawa, torpedo squadron commander at Midway. Furukawa was so handsome that Teichi Makajima, a news photograph her assigned to the Akagi to cover the battle, mentally tagged him Sanai Takasugi, the name of a noted movie actress. To sort out the officers aboard the carrier, Makajima gave a number of key personnel unspoken nicknames for his own use. Fuchida was Hitler. Have our reconnaissance planes already left the Tone and Chikuma? Fuchida asked Furukawa. Not yet. They'll take off at the same time as the launching of the first attack wave. Furukawa briefed him on the search pattern. Something about it made Fuchida uneasy. The search wasn't complete. Gaps much too large for security existed between each segment of the search arc, but there was nothing Fuchida could do about it, and realising that he was underfoot at the command post, he climbed down to the flight deck. There, weary from his efforts, he lay down. One of his comrades, seeing him thus sprawled out, brought a parachute, which Fuchida tucked behind his head. Then he fished some paper and a pencil out of his pocket and prepared to take notes. He was in a perfect position to do so. All the other officers had duties that absorbed them. Fuchida could survey the scene without distraction. From his vantage point just below the command post, he could hear the shouts from above, watch the planes overhead, see the action on the flight deck. He had a good view of the bridge and could catch snatches of conversation going on there. He was pleased to hear Gender's crisp accents. These two men whose careers had followed such parallel paths reacted identically in this urgent hour. No more than Fuchida could Genda remain in sick bay when important duties awaited him. Start engines, Masuda ordered. With a flurry of excitement and a deafening roar, the first wave of fighters and bombers thundered off the Akagi to attack Midway. Replacing Fuchida in overall command was Lieutenant Joichi Tomonaga, head of the Hiryu's air unit. Of the exceedingly complicated battle action that ensued, Fuchida had direct knowledge only of what took place aboard and near the Akagi but that was quite enough to fill his eyes, ears, and notebook. During the early morning, several types of American land-based aircraft found the Nagumo force. They inflicted little damage, although their bombing disrupted fleet formation and their strafing killed a number of crewmen aboard the carriers. The speedy Zeros, backed by anti-aircraft fire, shot them down like clay pigeons. Unquestionably, these American airmen had courage. They flew right into that murderous fire, but their planes were obsolete, their bombing and torpedoing techniques were not too good, and they had no fighter cover. One B-26 missed the Akagi's bridge by about 10 metres, sped on toward the Hiryu, then plunged into the sea. Many of those watching jumped for joy. This is fun! exclaimed Fuchida. But Murata, waiting to lead his torpedo bombers in a second wave, took no part in the jubilation. He usually met any situation with a joke, this time he stood silently watching the death of a brave enemy. Makajima noted that Fuchida's face was pale and asked, Are you all right, Sotaicho? I'm all right, he replied. Anyway, I can't be in bed under such circumstances as this. Meanwhile, Japanese reconnaissance planes reached their outward search limit without sighting an enemy ship. According to Japanese estimates, the Pacific Fleet would not know of the Nagumo forces' presence until the capture of Midway drew American ships out. Just in case, Nagumo retained a good force of bombers armed with torpedoes. Although Tomonaga's attack on Midway had inflicted considerable damage, both in the air and on the ground, it had by no means put the base out of operation or destroyed its defences. Dissatisfied with these results, Tomonaga radioed his recommendation for a second attack. Nagumo decided to comply. This meant that second-wave planes loaded with torpedoes for attacking ships had to be rearmed with bombs for use against ground targets. The maintenance men hurried with this work because Nagumo wanted to send Murata and the rest off to Midway in time to catch the American land-based planes when they touched down on the runways. 
About halfway through the changeover, a scout plane reported ten American surface ships. After a quick plotting of their position, Nagumo hastily belayed the order to exchange torpedoes for bombs. If the American force contained no carrier, his aircraft could hit Midway again and take care of these ships too. While all this was going on, Midway-based planes attacked two more times. But like the other strikes, they inflicted little damage. They only reinforced the smug belief of the First Air Fleet's men that the enemy bombardiers were poor marksmen, and that in all probability the Americans had no carriers in the area. If one lurked nearby, why had it not sent fighters to cover the bombers? The scout's follow-up report about a carrier accompanying the U.S. surface force reached the Akagi about the same time Tomonaga's first wave appeared for landing. To save those flyers from ditching, Nagumo, on the advice of both Kusaka and Genda, decided not to launch an attack on the American carrier until after recovering the first wave planes. This involved clearing the decks and re-equipping with torpedoes the aircraft already loaded with land bombs. Chihaya, Beethoven to Makajima, wore a scowl as he strode across the flight deck with his fellow dive bomber commander, Lieutenant Shohei Yamada. Both men were furious because the first air fleet's anti-aircraft had at first mistaken Tomonaga's incoming flight for more Americans and shot at them. Avid for details of the action at Midway, Fuchida asked them if enemy fighters had come out. About ten minutes before we reached the island, Grumman's came out to give us a hell of a time, Yamada replied. Asked about anti-aircraft fire on the island, he added that this was fiercer than expected. Meanwhile, maintenance men below decks unloaded big 800-kilogram bombs. In their haste, they piled them near the hangar instead of returning them to the magazines. Just as the last first wave plane touched down, another attack group roared overhead. The first American carrier-based planes the Nagumo force had seen that day. So the report of an enemy carrier proved correct. Unescorted by fighters and using primitive tactics, the torpedo bombers pressed their attacks bravely, but had no more success than the aircraft from Midway. Bomber after bomber spun, wobbled and dropped into the sea. One of them seemed bent on crashing into the Akagi's bridge, but it too missed its mark to fall into the sea. Throughout the torpedo attack, preparations continued for launching the Akagi's second wave. The first zero took wing. At that moment, Fuchida saw the approach of American hell divers. He yelled a warning to the command post, and the Akagi's machine guns and anti-aircraft barked into fire. The first bombardier appeared off target. Fuchida figured that he would miss. Sure enough, he came into his glide too far out, and his bomb hit about ten metres from the carrier on the starboard side, sending a huge geyser of dark grey water high in the air. Some of it poured down on the Akagi, dousing the bridge and blackening the faces of everyone there. Close on the tail of the first hell diver came a second. The thought flashed across Fuchida's mind. This one will adjust on the leader and will be much nearer the target. As if in answer, the American swooped in and released his bomb. It struck close to the elevator amidships, twisting it grotesquely and dropping it into the hangar. Bright yellow light blazed into Makajima's face, and the blast smashed him against a steel bulkhead. His body felt as if it had been torn apart, but miraculously he was uninjured. Fuchida saw the explosion. Terrible, he thought, but the flight deck hasn't been hit. He screwed up his eyes against the bright sunshine and watched a third dive bomber follow in some distance behind the second. This one will make adjustments too and probably hit the flight deck, he told himself apprehensively. So he rolled over on his stomach, pressed his face tight against the deck, and linked his hands over his head. The bomb struck near the port flight deck and crashed through it into the hangar. Fuchida estimated the bomb to weigh about 250 kilograms. Usually one of this size would do comparatively little damage, but two circumstances made this an exception. First, the bombs from all the changeabouts clustered around the hangar deck. When the American missile penetrated, it landed in the middle of a stack of bombs. One set off the next, and they exploded at the rate of one or two a minute. Second, fully armed aircraft crowded the flight deck. These caught fire from the blaze below, each plane igniting the other until the deck became a sweeping sea of flame. Realising that the blazing flight deck was no place for him, Fuchida moved to the briefing room. Their haste matched confusion, 
with sailors hauling in the wounded and disposing of them as best they could. Fuchida stopped one rescue worker to ask, Why aren't you taking the wounded down to sick bay? The entire ship is on fire and no one can get through, he replied. Horror struck, Fuchida recalled the thirty-some men still in sick bay, now hopelessly trapped. He reeled out of the briefing room with the idea of reaching his cabin to salvage what he could, but fire and smoke turned him back. Well might Fuchida reflect on the interweavings of fate. If he had not been so eager to watch the takeoff and send his comrades away with a personal good wishes, he would have burned to death, either in sick bay or in his cabin. He had received a sobering lesson in the limitations of common sense. The human spirit has a built-in wisdom of its own. Reason dictated that he stay below, recuperating. Yet something beyond reason sent him topside, and that same something had brought gender from certain death. Up to this moment, Fuchida had been so preoccupied with events aboard the Akagi that he had not noticed what was taking place elsewhere. Now, headed for the bridge, he looked across the sea and stopped dead. The Kaga was a huge ball of smoke and fire, and off in the other direction flame and smoke enveloped the Soryu. He knew then that the Japanese had lost this battle, which he had opposed in principle but never doubted they would win. The first air fleet had gone, and for what? Even the capture of Midway would not have been worth this price. Perhaps the Hiryu's planes, the surface force or the submarines could snatch something from the wreck, but this was defeat. Fuchida wandered to the bridge in a daze. Although his brain was numb, his legs kept moving, taking him instinctively to the one man on Nagumo's staff who could realise the full magnitude of the disaster. Wordlessly he faced gender, haggard and stiff with grief, his friend shot him a look and spoke one word, Shimata, we goofed. No one else said anything, or needed to. 16. By this time, smoke and flames had reached the bridge. Kusaka urged Nagumo to leave the ship with his staff and establish headquarters elsewhere. At first, Nagumo resisted, preferring to go down with the Akagi in the traditional gesture. But Kusaka, who had little use for futile dramatics, persisted. The Hiryu is still intact, we must continue fighting with her. Atlas Nagumo agreed that his larger duty lay with those still living. He ordered his aide to contact the light cruiser Nagara and send over three small boats for the first air fleet staff. Meanwhile, fire and smoke had sealed off egress from the bridge to the deck. The officers on the bridge had to leave by climbing out a window and sliding down a rope to a small deck adjacent to the briefing room on which stood a machine gun battery. They hurried for the machine gun deck was already awash in flames. Nagumo and his staff swarmed down that rope like Etajima cadets. Kusaka, who was quite stout, almost stuck in the frame. About halfway down his scorched hands lost their grip and he fell to the deck, spraining both ankles and burning one leg. Fuchida was the last man off the bridge. The operations room directly under him was hot as a chimney. The end of the rope caught fire as he worked his way down. All this time, the unending chaos of violence below decks shook the Akagi like cobblestone streets jolting a baby carriage. Just as his feet touched the deck, a thunderous explosion hurled him eight or ten feet in the air in a wide parabola. He landed on the flight deck with a crunching smash. Stunned by the explosion and the fall, he attempted to struggle to his feet, but both his legs had been broken. Once more he attempted to rise, but could not. Demoralised and shattered, he relapsed into a sitting position. I was weary from my operation, he recalled. I kept getting weaker, sweat was pouring down my face, black spots moved before my eyes, and I was afraid vertical bar might faint. Swirls of smoke and little tongues of flame crept closer. His brain told him to crawl along the deck to the bow, which had not yet caught fire, but in his weariness and pain it seemed like too much trouble. Mentally, Fuchida squared his shoulders and lifted his chin. All right, he told himself. If this is the end of my life, I am ready to go. His clothes began to smolder and smoke stung his eyes. At that propitious moment, two enlisted men raced by and spotted him. They scooped him up and carried him down to the outside passage. Just as they reached the anchor deck, the last boat carrying Nagumo's staff pulled off. Wait, come back, the sailors yelled, and it swung about. His rescuers put Fuchida in a big net sling and lowered him carefully into the small boat. 
As the craft cut through the sea away from the Akagi, Fuchida raised himself for one last look at the Grand Carrier. His thoughts turned in grief to the officers and men already killed, and those who would still die aboard her and the other carriers. Then he reflected that on this day he had escaped death twice by the narrowest possible margins. Sotaicho, you must lie down, Dr. Tamai cautioned him. Fuchida nodded and obeyed. As the boat nudged against the cruiser Nagara, sailors lifted Fuchida out and carried him aboard. There he saw many wounded stretched out on blankets on the main deck. Sympathy and distress welled up in him as his bearers bore him past his old shipmates, some covered with blood, some with mangled arms and legs, some frightfully burned. The men hurried Fuchida straight to a hospital room. The surgeon, a lieutenant, was already swamped with work, but he wanted to drop everything and care for Fuchida, who bore the rank of commander and was well known. This he would not allow. My injuries are not serious, just broken legs, he said. Those up on deck need help much more than I. Take care of them first, then come to me. So his bearers took him to the officers' quarters, a compartment of four bunks, and deposited him gently in an upper one. Opposite him lay Kusaka, his hands, feet and ankles bandaged. Later in the hospital room the surgeon carefully examined and x-rayed Fuchida. The pictures showed both legs broken around ankle and arch. One break was a simple fracture, another showed a clean break with the bone slightly separated, and in a third the bone was twisted. The first two should mend within a few months, explained the surgeon. The twisted bone will require at least six. Fuchida couldn't complain. He was thankful to be alive. The lieutenant set his legs, put them in casts, then treated him for burns on the neck and hands. Several times that evening, Jenda came to the compartment to report to Kusaka. Fuchida heard him tell Kusaka that Nagumo planned to seek out the enemy and destroy him in night action. Nagumo is deceiving himself, Fuchida reflected silently. How can he hope to defeat the Americans without air power? By this time, Fuchida knew that the Hiryu had also been bombed. Japan had lost not only four carriers, but all their aircraft. Thanks to prompt action and fine rescue work, many of the air crews had been saved. But aside from these men, all that remained of the first air fleet was Nagumo, his staff, and the auxiliary ships. Early the next morning, the Japanese had to sink the Akagi and Hiryu to keep them from falling into American hands. For Fuchida, except for the loss of the Akagi, the worst moment of the battle came when Yamaguchi went down with the Hiryu. His staff begged him to leave the doomed vessel but he refused. Fuchida didn't blame Yamaguchi for adhering to Japanese tradition. In his place, Fuchida would have done the same, but he knew that Yamaguchi would have served Japan better by living, to give his country the continuing benefit of his experience and inspirational leadership. Genda was terribly upset over the loss of the carriers. Fuchida tried to cheer him up. Don't worry too much. We still have most of our ships and our land-based air power on our islands in the Pacific. These are aircraft carriers too, though they're stationary. We can't carry on offensive operations without floating aircraft carriers, but we can defend ourselves against the enemy with land-based aircraft. All of which was whistling in the dark. Wars are not won from defensive postures, and no one knew it better than Minoru Genda and Mitsuo Fuchida. Up to, and including Midway, the keynote of Japanese naval strategy had been aggressive operations, Shinko Sakusen, after Midway, the Imperial Navy had to adopt defensive operations, Yogeki Sakusen. This was the real meaning of the battle. The United States had snatched away the initiative that Japan had seized at Pearl Harbor, and throughout the agonizing months ahead would never let it go. During the voyage back to Japan, many of the wounded transferred to battleships of the main fleet, which had better medical facilities than the rescue cruisers and destroyers. Fuchida, however, remained aboard the Nagara with Nagumo's staff. He had always been an operations type. Now, with both legs sunk in plaster, he became in effect a staff officer, though not by official orders. His friends kept him informed of events during the cruise homeward. Nagumo was in a black depression. Onishi came to Kusaka to say that all of the first air fleet staff were prepared to commit suicide to atone for Midway and he subtly but unmistakably hinted that Kusaka should urge Nagumo Todu likewise. Whereupon Kusaka laid Onishi out in no uncertain terms. 
This was no time to think of suicide. Their duty was to live, fight, and win future victories. Kusaka reported this conversation to Nagumo. The latter had to agree with Kusaka's reasoning, but he added despondently, Matters often don't follow logic. Only with difficulty did the Chief of Staff extract the Commander-in-Chief's promise that he wouldn't commit a rash act. Kusaka related the incident to Fuchida in the strictest confidence. You said the right thing, Fuchida told him approvingly. Privately, he felt a little impatient. In his opinion, Harakiri was an individual matter, not a suitable subject for discussions with colleagues and friends. Gender gave him a spirited account of a conference held on the Yamato between key staff officers of the Combined Fleet and the First Air Fleet. Kusaka presented Nagumo and reported at length on the battle, pulling no punches. He closed by acknowledging that he and Nagumo bore a heavy burden of responsibility and stood ready to suffer the consequences. He asked that, if possible, both be given the opportunity to pay off the score in battle. This straightforward request so touched Yamamoto that tears filled his eyes, and he could only reply gruffly, All right. Kusaka also hinted that the question of Harakari preyed on Nagumo's mind. Yamamoto settled the matter by stating forcefully, No, Nagumo is not to blame. I take full responsibility. If anyone is to commit Harakiri because of Midway, it is I. That was the type of commander Yamamoto was, Fuchida reminisced, and that is why we officers served under him so willingly and respected him so highly. When Genda returned to the Nagara, she sped ahead of the Yamato bound for Kura, so that Genda and the rest of the First Air Fleet staff could begin working on a plan to reorganize Japan's remaining naval air power. From Kure, the Nagara proceeded to Hashirajima, where Fuchida and about 500 wounded were moved to the hospital ship Hikawa Maru. All of those injured in the midway battle were to be rounded up for treatment at the Yokosuka Naval Hospital. Kusaka had urged Ugaki to tell the Japanese people the truth, but the Navy ignored this excellent advice. Newspapers and newscasts proclaimed midway a great victory, and radio broadcasts began with the playing of the battleship march. If the wounded fanned out all over Japan, the truth about the disaster would inevitably leak out. The day before the Hikawa Maru sailed for Yokosuka, Yamamoto boarded the ship to visit the wounded. He came first to Fuchida's room for a long talk. Fuchida never forgot the sight of the Admiral smiling down at him with fatherly affection. Having heard about Fuchida's appendectomy but not his crash landing on the Akagi's deck, he was surprised and concerned to find the flyer with both legs in casts. Not until he had satisfied himself with Fuchida's progress did he get down to business. The midway battle is lost, he said uncompromisingly. Now what do you think of the situation? Fuchida replied along the lines he had followed with gender. We have lost four carriers and some other ships, this is true. But we still have all the big battleships, most of the cruisers, light cruisers and destroyers. In addition, we have our unsinkable aircraft carriers, our island bases, for Navy planes. Yamamoto nodded in agreement. He knew even better than Fuchida that the combined fleet remained a force to be reckoned with. But Fuchida had more on his mind, and appreciated this unexpected chance to air his views without going through a maze of channels. He propped himself up as best he could and spoke. We are in an epoch-making period. He began slowly, feeling his way. You see, all the battleships, many of the cruisers and destroyers scarcely got into battle at Midway. It was a fight between carriers in large measure. Now these big battleships, like the Yamato, Nagato and the rest of the main body, went to Midway and back to Japan without seeing action. This was not news to Yamamoto, but he listened intently while Fuchida marshalled his thoughts. It encouraged him to proceed. Midway was a tragedy, yes, and we have come to the end of the battleship era. But all is not lost if we will learn the imperative lesson of Midway, the full and complete advent of naval aviation. We must accept the truth of Midway and plan toward the future accordingly. Japan must face the facts of naval air power. A scene from the past flashed across Fuchida's memory. Do you remember, Commander-in-Chief, that when I was air officer of the 3rd Carrier Division, I advocated reversal of the roles of the carriers and battleships? You may recall that I used to describe the defensive role of the carriers as Abe Kobe. 
I am very sorry that we did not make the change in naval air power several years ago, replied Yamamoto. Then he patted Fuchida's shoulder and added kindly, Don't worry now, Fuchida. We will make all the necessary adjustments at once. Fuchida was much relieved that his plain speaking had not offended the Admiral, and glad to hear his assurance of reform. I am very happy to serve under such a great commander, he answered gratefully. After Yamamoto left Fuchida's cabin, he spent about three hours greeting the rest of the wounded. For every man, he had a firm handshake and words of concern and encouragement. Keep your spirits high. We have much confidence for the future, he said as he moved from bunk to bunk. But what he said mattered little. His presence was the real morale booster. The sound of his light, quick footsteps, the sight of his stocky form, the impact of his dynamic personality zipped through these men like a shot of adrenaline. Every man wanted to rise and follow him back into battle. After Yamamoto was piped over the side, the Hikawa Maru weighed anchor and crept into Yokosuka. The ship laid off the harbour until dark so that area residents might not see so many wounded disembark. The sick and injured landed at the Nagara Pier, a back way into the base, smuggled like contraband down the road between a heavy escort of shore police. At the base hospital they were settled into two buildings, which were put under close security guard. There they lived isolated from the outside world. Visitors, even wives, were prohibited, along with phone calls and letters. Just like an internment camp, Fuchida thought angrily. Trained to be stoical, Japanese men-at-arms could bear pain, discomfort, inconvenience and tedium, but under this grimsy stem they became demoralised. The spirit that made the first air fleet the terror of the seas and the pride of a nation faltered and would never completely revive. Trust in the government shriveled into cynicism. From the newspapers and radio, Fuchida soon understood that the wounded had been put under wraps to keep the real story of Midway from the Japanese public, even from most of the military. Up to this time, the press had reported naval actions rather faithfully. Beginning with Midway, however, the government initiated a policy of suppressing the truth. Propped up in his hospital cot, rustling newspapers and twisting the radio dial, Fuchida asked himself, What's the point? The enemy knows all about our losses and will soon tell the rest of the world. It would be much wiser if Navy headquarters itself announced that Japan had lost four carriers and one heavy cruiser. That way they would get the jump on the American press and prove that the government had confidence in the courage and strength of the Japanese people. Sooner or later the facts must come out. When they did, the public would be angry at the deception. It was little short of torture for a man as gregarious as Fuchida to be locked up with only newspaper and radio propaganda for company. The situation might have been easier if he had been really sick, half-conscious and self-absorbed, but from the knees up he was perfectly well. By devious means he managed to make a few phone calls. The authorities looked the other way, knowing him to be a favourite of Yamamoto. Fuchida counted on this. He had no qualms about using influence when it seemed effective. While Fuchida was thus immured, headquarters of the first air fleet moved to the battleship Kirishima. The photographer, Makajima, noted that Nagumo, Kusaka, and especially Genda looked worn out. You can never go back to Tokyo, an officer warned Makajima. If you did, you would be arrested by the Kempeitai, military police. Makajima knew he would never be permitted on the loose in the nation's capital. He knew too much about Midway, so he asked to remain with the fleet, where he could die if die he must, in a respectable way. Rather than wait for the third air fleet to be combat ready, he requested transfer to a cruiser headed for the Indian Ocean on a raiding mission. Thus this keen observer passed out of Fuchida's ken. During Fuchida's hospitalization, the third air fleet came into being with 29 ships, six carriers, two battleships, five cruisers, and 16 destroyers. Kusaka counted two pluses in this arrangement. The carriers had been brought together and the fleet would be a permanent organisation. But much to his disappointment, the Navy did not abandon the big ship big gun concept as he called it. He was sorry to lose Genda, who became air officer of the Zuikaku, but found his successor, Commander Takeshi Naito, a satisfactory substitute. Naito had been a classmate of Fuchida's at Kasumigara and the Naval Staff College. Of these developments, Fuchida was unaware. 
outside the hospital, no one knew where he was except the Navy Personnel Bureau. It was ridiculous, he fumed. After about a month of grinding boredom and official foolishness, he compared notes with Agusa, under treatment for burns on his hands and arms. Both were fed up. They decided on a jailbreak and began waiting for the right moment. When it came, Agusa telephoned for a taxi and boldly carried Fuchida to it on his broad back. They sped off to their families, Egusa to Kamakura and Fuchida to Zushi. Haruko greeted her husband joyously, but with no surprise. At that time, many Navy families lived at Zushi, and through the intra service, Grapevine had a fairly good idea of what had happened at Midway. Haruko had heard that her husband was in the hospital, but she didn't know the extent of his injuries. Fearing he was in serious condition, she was relieved to find him with nothing worse than leg fractures. The children whooped with delight and hung on to their father. Yoshia was old enough to realize that Japan was at war and that his father had been injured during a battle. Miyako, five years old, only knew that once more she had both of her adored parents with her. When the children were out of earshot, Fuchida spoke frankly to Haruko about Midway. She offered little comment beyond remarking, I assumed that something had gone wrong. She sensed that he didn't want to discuss the battle further. He just needed to get it out of his system. With her air of reassuring calm, Haruko made an ideal audience. She was never too busy to listen when he wanted to talk and disappeared tactfully when he lapsed into brooding silence. All this pleasant comfort made Fuchida uneasily conscious of the gap between his situation and that of his comrades. And worried. Someone should put him on convalescent leave before he turned up on roll call as AWOL. But where exactly did he belong in the Navy? Who was his commander? Seeking clarification, he wrote to Captain Taijiro Aoki, the Akagi's ex-skipper, asking permission to stay at home instead of returning to the Yokosuka hospital. He didn't like to bother Aoki, but he had to find out where he stood and protect his position. Fuchida deserved a reprimand for going AWOL. Instead, Navy Department orders came assigning him to Yokosuka Naval Base. He was to report to Hirayama Springs at Ito. In happier days, this beautiful hot springs resort on scenic Izu Peninsula had been a favourite vacation spot and health spa for the wealthy. Now he and ten or more patients took the baths for broken bones. Security being relatively light, his family could visit him. All things considered, his two months at Ito contented him. But he believed that the reason for his plush assignment was to keep him away from Yokosuka Hospital where he might have led a revolt of patients and attracted public attention to their number. After his treatment at Ito, Fuchida returned home to Zushi. There he lived in semi-isolation, for he could not yet walk on crutches and never left the house. Not even his brother and sisters visited him, being unaware of the situation. So Fuchida talked with Haruko and spent time playing with the children. He tried his hand at oil painting. He and Yoshia made many models of Japanese airplanes from balsa wood and rice paper. These they hung from the living room ceiling. Haruko accepted with equanimity such unorthodox additions to the house. Both Yoshia and Miyako remembered those model aircraft long after other, seemingly more important matters had escaped them. Fuchida devoured the newspapers. He didn't trust them, but they helped to pass the time. Out of his knowledge of the places and personalities in the news, he tried to piece together at least a general idea of what was happening in the outside world. He longed to recover and return to active duty, regretting that the whirlpool of events had spun him into this peaceful backwater. The long struggle for Guadalcanal dominated the last months of 1942. Slowly but surely the United States proceeded on the offensive, and then at the Battle of Santa Cruz in late October, Nagumo restored much of the luster to his reputation. Their Japanese forces destroyed the Hornet and damaged the Enterprise, but with good news came bad. Leading the torpedo plane attack, Fuchida's dear comrade Murata plunged to his death. Many leaves dropped from the trees before Fuchida received crutches. He hobbled on them with considerable difficulty, for he couldn't use either foot for balance. By the end of November he could get about quite well. Around that time he received his first visitor, Captain Toshiyuke Yokoi, chief of instructors at Yokosuka. A pilot, a keen student of air power and a brilliant man, Yokoi acted as something of a one-man brain trust for Rear Admiral Keizo Ueno, 
the installation's president. Yokoi brought good news. He asked Fuchida to come to Yokosuka and assist him in making a survey of the Battle of Midway. Fuchida agreed enthusiastically. Yokoi assigned him quarters on base. Fuchida would stay there on weekdays and go home weekends, taking advantage of the transportation that Yokoi thoughtfully provided. At Yokosuka, Fuchida studied not only Midway, but also the Coral Sea and Indian Ocean engagements. He didn't delve further into Pearl Harbor. Yokosuka already had studied it thoroughly. He stayed on this assignment from December 1942 to June 1943, working on his studies, doing research and questioning survivors who came to Yokosuka to talk with him. For each of these naval battles, he wrote a pamphlet that the Navy distributed for officers to study. In the case of Midway, Yokosuka authorised only six copies. The security lid remained clamped on that one. Fuchida regretted this, for he believed that the Japanese Navy had much to learn from Midway. Some admirals didn't like his monographs because they were honest. Where Fuchida felt the Japanese had erred, he said so, and went into explicit, sometimes unpalatable detail. In all of his pamphlets he preached the gospel. This is an epoch-making time. It may already be too late, we must have an up-to-date strategy. This quiet, scholarly interlude in Fuchida's life was a valuable experience. At the age of 40, he was practically a greybeard by the standards of aerial combat. Even if he had never been injured, soon he would have been forced to leave the field of action to younger men. His injuries and convalescence permitted him to make the transition without regret. Here at Yokosuka, he had the priceless practice of presenting his ideas clearly, in logical order, and mastering his command of the language. Perhaps most important, although incapacitated for combat, he could still contribute to his nation's war effort. Into dangerous areas, a flight of American P-38s ambushed both aircraft. Ugaki's bomber crashed into the sea. He escaped with a broken arm and other relatively minor injuries. Yamamoto's bomber caught fire and smashed into the dense jungle of Bougainville. The body of the commander-in-chief was found on the seat outside of the plane, still gripping his sword. It had not decomposed yet and was said to be in a state of great dignity. He must have been superhuman. Thus wrote Ugaki a year later. 